Okay, welcome back. So when we last left off, we were talking about Manet, and um, I think the, I mean, there there's so much you could get into in terms of like analysis of this painting, um, but I think that uh, just in terms of understanding, you know, like the importance of it in terms of uh, just the the kind of the visual tricks of of us looking at her but she's got a mirror behind her and then that's looking into you know so we're seeing the world that she's looking onto um she's in this position where she's serving all these people um she's working as a you know as a bartender um we see the reflection maybe of her back or maybe the reflection of another young woman's back um and a patron uh and in the Apparently in the original, when he first started to draw out and paint the painting, that he had the reflection of us, like the customer, more directly in the view. But then he decided to go with it slightly off to the side, where it's more ambiguous as to whether it's our reflection or someone else's reflection. Um, and all of this is going on in this, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, almost as, as dense a layering of, of things you can think about and, and ways you can think about image and, you know, representation as you know as a um, la meninas but we move on so in terms of modernism one of the things to you know to understand is that a lot of what we've been talking about has been going on in france and really just in paris but the things that were happening in paris and france were starting to be very influential in other parts of the world um, and so we see that influence in england and even in america um, so we're going to talk about some American artists here, uh, John, John Singer Sargent, who um, we've already seen Madam X, but here are some other, other artwork of Sargent's. And you can see how it's a, his approach is, in some ways, especially on Madam X, is a little bit more conservative, closer to Fenton Latour, um, but that there is definitely an influence in this, in, you know, from the kind of the Manet school of learning to let the paint just be paint, let the marks just be marks, let the shapes be as flat as they need to be, you know, not like forcing them into being super um, rounded um, and letting the illusion of light and space develop by the eye rather than by, you know, forcing it through modeling everything. And a contemporary of, of Sargent would be um, Whistler. And so, so far, I think the first Whistler we saw was his mezzotint of, um, his mezzotint version of arrangement in, in gray and black. Um, and Whistler brings in kind of like a, a different sort of idea that I think is important to consider, which is that um, some of the, there was also other trends, other aesthetic trends. So like Whistler was obsessed, part of this kind of group called the Orientalists. So um, both in terms of like decorative things that he'd be bringing into his paintings, um, but also kind of decorative decisions about how he's going to use shapes in his paintings, like the arrangement of these flowers there, um, and a willingness to kind of flatten in the same way. Like by this point, Europeans were starting to see uh, Japanese woodblock uh, prints and were very interested in these kind of flattening effects that they were seeing in art from other parts of the world and realizing that art does not have to always be about making the most amount of space and volume and light and form um, that sometimes you can allow like such as this shape of this space back here allow that to just be just be a shape And Whistler was in some ways quite controversial because of some of his paintings being so hard to read. Like this is a painting of fireworks or looking at a, at a sea scene with fireworks going off. And in fact, I believe this is the painting that eventually led to the, the famous trial where he uh, sued a critic. Uh, I believe it was Ruskin who he sued. Um, and, and we don't have time to cover all of that. But over here, we have the, uh, the Thomas Aikens painting that we looked at in the previous unit and I just wanted to include Aikens in there as you know because the two Americans that other that we've been talking about Sargent and uh, Whistler are both Americans but Americans who are primarily living in Europe going living in England and then also traveling to the continent whereas Aikens was 
an American who, although he studied in France, uh, pretty much lived his entire rest of his life um, in America, mostly in the Philadelphia area. Um, and then another kind of connection to America is Degas. Degas was not American, but he did have some of his family uh, lived in New Orleans, and some of his family lived in Italy. And um, and unlike many of the contemporaries, he'd actually been to a lot of places other than France, and that kind of made it was kind of a part of his development as an aesthetic, his aesthetic. Um, I, I really find this painting to be beautiful, and I think one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is how it's quite, it's an early painting, it's quite different from Degas' work in general, and I think that it also shows a little bit of like at this time he was living in Italy, and how much he was really kind of like trying to pick up influences from uh, the early Renaissance and the high Renaissance as much as he was picking up influences from more traditional sources of like Baroque and Romantic paintings. All right, well, we've seen the tub many times before. I, I do want to say, how much time do I have? I've got some time. About which is about this issue of, I decide, one of the things I, when I'm organizing this course, course is I want to use as many artworks over again as much as possible. Because although many of these are familiar to me and I love to see new works of art, and I could easily make a lecture where I cover Degas and show you all works that you've never seen before, I think it's important for you that you get to see some of the same works and you get to see them in, in different contexts that we've talked about this image in terms of as a representation of pastel drawing and how pastel is different from other forms of drawing and how much is pastel like painting. So we talked about it in that context. We've talked about it in terms of composition. We talked about it in terms of hierarchy and emphasis, how it creates certain hierarchies. Um, we've talked about it in terms of space, how it creates space through overlapping. Um, and here we're talking about it in terms of as part of Degas' career. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting is, you know, towards the end of his career, more and more, he focused on on pastel and pastel drawing uh, or pastel painting. Um, and and he really did, towards the end of his career, also kind of like pick certain kind of subject matters. And and the bather, a woman alone, kind of you know bathing, was a was a common subject for him. Also, um, dancers, like ballerina dancers, was very, especially towards the end of his career. Pizarro is um, an important artist, part of this group of, you know, more of the um, generation of Manet, maybe just a little bit younger than Manet. Um, and for a much of his painting, a pretty conservative painter, at least by the standards of the people that we now call um, the Impressionists, certainly not um, not conservative compared to most of the people painting in Paris at the time, but um, he then became much more radical later in his career when he was uh, influenced by uh, Seurat. But I love this period of his painting. Uh, this one, I believe, is in the, um, uh, I think it might be in the Met. It's either at the Met or I think it's at the Met. Um, and it's just a there's so much space and I love the feeling of um, what it's like to walk you know small country road and to see a hill and a village and a little valley between between the hills so the two artists that I think of who most you know and we don't have time to talk about every single hold on all right that's my one minute warning um, all right, we're going to end there, and then we're going to wrap up talking about the Impressionists into the uh, post-Impressionists.